Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Glendon Holst, and my colleagues here today is uh, David Poog, the data scientist in the uh, 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 KVL Visualization Lab, um, and also Saber Faiki, who is the um, uh, lead at the uh, KSL, the Supercomputing Lab, and um, <clears throat> and our teams are providing a uh, uh, this best practices workshop today geared toward people who are doing deep learning on IBEX uh, to help you make the most effective use of these resources, um, <clears throat> both for um, yourselves and, and for others. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing uh, my screen and then we'll, we will uh, begin. So we're part of the core labs. Um, uh, part of, of our lab, uh, the KSL, is responsible for um, the um, support of, of, of IBEX and Shaheen and um, these HPC clusters and the apps on them. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and our team is, um, helps with uh, visualization, workflow, and data science training. And so what I'd like to talk to you today about is um, how to make the best use of, of IBEX. So <clears throat> we'll do a kind of a quick intro of some prerequisites that hopefully you've already had. Um, hopefully um, you had uh, all attended, if not uh, this morning's training on um, using IBEX, the basics of Slurm and so on, um, but at least uh, seen the training, taking the training previously. Um, there's some links there uh, for you as well um, if you want to kind of look at some uh, previous materials. <clears throat> We're going to discuss um, two uh, aspects of deep learning. One is basically how to get um, more done with the, the, res the available resources and then um, some options to increase access to, to more resources, kind of a more advanced um, resource access and use. So <clears throat> probably the, the, the most challenging aspect of moving your deep learning uh, training to IBEX is that IBEX is just so radically different from your workstation. It is monstrously big um, and powerful and capable, <clears throat> but um, it also hosts a lot of other users. And um, so lots of people contending for those resources. Um, it's you know, very heterogeneous. And so uh, with lots of different options and the <clears throat> uh, familiar things like you know, file systems and things of like that, that that you might have in your workstation, they exist, but in kind of a different way on IBEX. So this here is a table um, that's uh, reasonably up to date of the, the available GPU resources on IBEX. And as you can see, they're broken down into uh, different GPU models. Um, and um, there's also some important and interesting statistics associated with each one. <clears throat> one is you know, the number of GPUs that are in each node. Um, especially when you start to want to um, scale up your training and use multiple GPUs, this will become important. Um, how much memory the GPUs have is important <clears throat> as well. That will um, you will need to know that to take to fully utilize them. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's important is the number of cores per GPU. These are CPU cores. Now, even though your the the primary computation of your training happens on the GPUs, you need the CPU doing um, kind of background tasks, feeding the GPU with data, handling the I/O, and um, and so uh, you need to know how many CPU cores you could ask for um, per GPU, so that you can allocate the right amount of resources. Um, we also need to think about the amount of memory in the nodes. In particular, we need to think about it per GPU because we have to share that memory equally. And um, this is this is the memory on um, this is the, you know, the, the 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 main memory of the node. Um, <clears throat> this is different from the GPU memory, um, and is used for a variety of of purposes, including caching your data and, and training samples, uh, loading them in, um, and, and also keeping kind of um, duplicate copies of, of, of the image, the memory um, that's on the GPU itself. And um, 
So this table is, um, will come in handy later on when we refer back to some of the, the settings that, that we need to make and, and, um, and the choices we need to make for the types of resources that we ask for. Let's talk about getting from your workstation to IBEX. It, it's one of the things that makes it challenging is because IBEX is really so different. Like a computer is not a computer. You know, sometimes here people go, oh, you know, oh, you know, it's, you know, the compute cluster. Oh, well, that's where I need to do my work. Not always, but certainly if you want to, you know, scale work out and you want to go into production and you want to have access to lots of resources, yes. <clears throat> but your workstation is an important part of your workflow. It's kind of where you start. Um, there's things about it that are really nice. It's personal and that it all the resources are available to you. You never have to think, you know, how much resources do I need to allocate to this particular task or ask for? It's just, they're all available to you and only you. Uh, whereas in IBEX, uh, these resources are shared. You need to specify them and you need to specify right response to like, you know, CPU and memory and other things that you might not have considered on your personal computer. Um, on your workstation, you can work interactively. You have access to the, the, the display is all yours. It's always there. <clears throat> you can run all sorts of programs, you know, full graphical programs, and you can uh, iterate with them. You can leave them running in the background when you're not doing anything, and they can preserve your, the context of your work so you can come back, back to it. Um, but um, IBEX, on the other hand, is a batch mode operation. You script the things that you want to do, you send them off to be done, and they don't get done right, right away. Um, you kind of have to wait. And so it's more hands off. Um, another difference is that on your, your workstation, um, you will have local storage. Um, you may have an SSD drive, which is nice and fast, and only you can use it. Uh, on on IBEX, there's actually multiple file systems and they have a number of different performance characteristics. Uh, they're definitely very high performance, you know, but lots of other people are also using them at the same time. And so you need to make sure that you're using the right resource for the type of work that you're doing so that you get performance that uh, matches the compute capability of IBEX. And the other thing that you will need to keep in, in mind is that the software environments that um, uh, that you use. So um, the one nice thing about this is that uh, using Conda, where we're able to create environments that are similar, the same, or at least equivalent between um, both your workstation and IBEX. And the nice thing about that is that, um, you know, you can debug things and work through issues with the exact same environment that you'll be using in production. Um, and so that that's, that's one of the, the nice stories of the transition of how to transition from the workstation to IBEX. <clears throat> so let's start off with the basics of logging um, in. Glendon. Yeah. Um, sorry, just before we get too far into this, um, I just wanted to let everybody know that if they have any questions um, during this, they can put the questions into the Q&A um, box, which is should be down at the bottom of the screen on the kind of the right hand side. And then I will try to keep an eye on the Q&A and then either answer things myself, uh, if I can answer them, or I'll flag stuff for, for you to answer. Great, thank you very so much. That's at any cool. time, if you have a question, just pop it into the Q and A, uh, the Q and A box, and I'll keep an eye on that. Cool, thank you. Um, so let, let's start off with, you know, making the transition from your workstation to IBEX. So uh, the, the first part of this is just to log on to uh, IBEX already, and that's not that hard. You've probably seen it in training, but I want to reinforce or, or just. Uh, I'll bring to your attention something that really helps to simplify the process. Uh, what you can do is you can uh, generate keys and have a passwordless login. Um, <clears throat> there is additional information that you can access um, in, the, in the URLs below. <clears throat> but here's what you can do if, if, if you set up your configuration correctly. You don't have to 
to SSH to shell into um, Ibex. You don't have to like put in the full name. You don't have to put in your name. Um, this SSH G login, boom, that's it. You're in, no passwords and you're there at, at the login node. Um, so that saves a lot of typing and, and hassle and it increases convenience. And the way that you would do this is in your um, SSH config file, you would put an entry under you know, host and you'd give it the name that you want to use. Um, then you, you specify what the full host name is. That's the one you normally would use. You specify who the user is, that will be you. <clears throat> and then you will uh, specify the identity file and um, which is this, the, the key that you have generated. This one will be the public key. Um, and, and those are the important bits. So, um, you know, you can look at the, at the intro to, to IVX 101 and uh, look at some of the documentation, but that's definitely um, worth investing your time to figure out how to make this work efficiently, because you'll probably be going back into IVX over and over and over again. Might as well make it nice and simple. Okay, <clears throat> now we get to your actual um, uh, deep learning training. So <clears throat> the first thing that you will need to do is to parameterize your training.python file. And you will need to be able to pass in arguments like batch size and whatever other parameters, kind of your hyperparameters that you need to specify to do your training. Um, this is this is this is really important on IBEX, and it's even useful and good practice on your own workstations. But I know a lot of people, um, you know, figuring out how to use our parse and this extra bit is is um, you know takes some effort, and so they just kind of want to go in and just kind of they just change the value directly because you know you just modify your code. <clears throat> so there's an there's a, there's a number of problems with this approach. <clears throat> but the key problem on IVEX is that um, your training, your Python training file is not run immediately. When you request a job on, on IVEX, <clears throat> um, it goes into a queue and you don't know when that job is going to run. And um, when it does, that's the point when your Python, um, your training Python file is read. So if you go into this file and modify, um, you know, some of the parameters, you know, that are hard coded, you don't know which one of those parameters was used by the time uh, IVX gets around to running it. Um, so you know, on your own workstation, maybe like, you know, you run it right away. And so this is kind of that immediacy, um, but in IBEX there isn't. So, so that's the one key reason to, um, to specify things by arguments, because uh, when you launch a job on IBEX, you will specify the arguments and those arguments will remain the same all the way through that job's life. <clears throat> There's other reasons though, to, um, <clears throat> to properly, um, use uh, arguments and pass your arguments in, um, <clears throat> even on your own workstation. So one is it makes it easier to do hyperparameter um, optimizations because um, you don't have to change your code every time you update some variable, you just call it multiple different ways. And then you can you know, test out the different hyperparameters. Um, another reason that you want to do it is that you can, um, keep track, you can log, when you have some results, um, you know, some training results, you can you can kind of keep track uh, based on um, how you called it in, in the, you know, you it's part of the logging, you will get information about what the parameters were. So, <clears throat> you know, the problem is that if you kind of hard code values and change them haphazardly, you know, you might get a, a training run that works really nice. And you're like, oh, how did I get that? And then, but you've changed the values and you kind of lost them. So it makes it easier to kind of keep track of those values if they're passed in as arguments. So that's the first thing you need to do is, um, is um, modify your, your, your training codes. The next thing that you'll need to do is you will need to wrap up uh, this training 
um, in a batch file, sorry, in, in, a, in a shell script. So um, normally what you would do on your workstation is you go like Python train, blah, 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 you pass in some arguments. Um, but, and so these are, are, are bash script, these are bash commands, but you won't be there interactively on Ibex to be able to type those in. So you need a way to kind of have a script that does that for you. And so this is the first step is to create that script. <clears throat> so making a, a bash script is actually fairly simple. Um, it, this is a simple, complete version right here. We start off with this um, hash bang sign. Um, this basically is a way to indicate to, to make this script executable. And it basically says that this is a bash script. Uh, the pound sign is a, um, a, 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 um, a comment in, in bash. Um, and then having at the very start of the file, kind of a hash and then an exclamation mark, the bang sign followed by a path to a program is the kind of the typical way to let bash know that it should be running the script with a particular interpreter. The next thing that you will need to do is you need to set up your environment. <clears throat> so when you work on your workstation, you may have done the conda activate and whatever environment already. So, you know, and then you, you just kind of keep working from that environment. But when you run the job on Ibex, you know, your initial state will not be the one with your environment loaded. So you need to do that. Um, the other thing here, just to point out, is that at that first line where we specified that we want to interpret with, with bash, uh, we need to say that we want a, a login a bash shell. And one of the reasons for that is um, to ensure that the conda activate functionality is there. Um, I will talk a little bit about kind of the training that, um, so, so David teaches a introduction to, to conda for um, data sci or scientists, data scientists, um, with more information about that there. So that's the that's the first step. So basically, you need to specify that this is a bash script, which is you know the, kind of the command line commands that are follow. You need to activate the environment that you normally run in, and then you need to run your training program, your training code. Now, there's a little bit of magic right here, which is this um, um, dollar sign at. It's a magic variable, um, and we put it in quotes. And what it does is it's going to take all the arguments that you passed in and pass them um, unmodified into your Python script. So this is important because when you run your, your, your training script, and so here's the example of running it below, um, when I pass in, you know, dash dash bash size equals 64, that argument is going to be passed in to the training script. And um, <clears throat> that little bit of magic with the dollar sign at, that's make sure that um, spaces that you've quoted properly uh, at the top level uh, remain properly quoted. You know, so if you have spaces inside of, um, of let's say file paths, but you've quoted it, you want that quoting to kind of make it all the way through um, in, into your, your, your batch file. So in, into your uh, into your uh, Python code, and as part of the arguments. So now what you've basically done is you've taken steps that you would normally do yourself, uh, possibly, and you've started to automate them, um, so that you can now have the same training script but pass in different arguments, and you can have a launcher that launches that scripts and this sets up the correct environment for it. <clears throat> okay, so at this point. You know, you should be able to run the, the this launching script um, on your workstation. Um, but before you can run it on Ibex, you need to run it as a job. And this means that you need to ask for particular resources. And so what we're going to do is we're going to modify this script. So after the, you know, pound sign, uh, bang, bin bash, that initial line, we're going to put some a, a, a additional s batch lines. So this is for Slurm. This is for the job manager. You've probably seen them before as part of Ibex uh, 101 training. Um, basically, the, you know the pound sign is is um, uh, indicates a um, 
comment, a line comment, but it gets interpreted a particular way if what follows it is sbatch. And so Slurm knows how to read these. And what follows after that is basically the um, command line flags that we you would use to the sbatch command. <clears throat> so the important ones, what we'll go through here for us is um, the number of nodes, <clears throat> the GPUs per node. <clears throat> and um, so um, I'm going to pause here for a second. This is new. So, um, so if you've been, so um, Slurm has been improving the um, uh, command line flags that it offers to specify uh, GPUs. <clears throat> and previously, you might have seen us give a training using GRES equals and then, you know, GPU and then the type of GPU. Um, so, um, the newer method is to specify GPUs per node, and this is the system team uh, assures me is now fully supported for the number of the other features that that they um, support as well. So this is the modern way to do it that also works on, on IBEX. <clears throat> the next thing um, that we will need to do is specify resources per GPU, and we'll talk a little bit more about those shortly. But you can see that we ask for a certain number of CPUs per GPU and a certain amount of memory per GPU. Um, we can also specify additional constraints with the uh, constraint um, uh, argument. And um, you can look at the documentation for Slurm. Um, I'll point out some uh, ways that you can find out what resources are available on IBEX shortly. Um, but in this example here, uh, we're asking for either a P100 or a GTX 1080, and it has to be on an Intel node, which is the default anyway. That's that's what we have. But um, so um, one thing to be careful of is um, is you don't want to go hog wild here and request all all the GPU types, right? Because some GPUs, as you saw in that chart at the beginning, some had 32 gigabytes of memory and some had only 12. So the problem is, is that, you know, it, if you tune your program to run efficiently with the 32 gigabyte V100, but you end up landing on, on a GTX 1080, um, your, your code may not run, um, or you may get, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you'll get a, a different performance characteristics. So, um, so typically though, you want to either uh, ask for GPUs that are very similar or just for one type of GPU that you have tuned for. And particularly when you start to scale up and do distributed or, um, or, or, you know, start to scale vertically on a node and have multiple GPUs, you really want a one particular type of GPU, usually V100, um, that has uh, um, the proper hardware support to work efficiently. And then you will do the other things, um, you know, like specifying how much time, and you should keep it under 24 hours, and I will, I will explain why later on, um, if possible. And, um, <clears throat> You specify the partition. Batch partition is the standard kind of work partition for IBEX. Um, you can also specify um, uh, output, uh, the, the log, the names of the log files for both the output and the error. So, um, uh, which correspond to like standard out and standard error. Um, and um, so, in this case here, we're we're also including the, the the job numbers as well, so that you can distinguish between di between different job runs. Okay, now we are ready. Okay, well, okay, and we will get to that in a second. I just wanted just to talk about. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Glendon. Yeah. Just a quick remark about that previous slide. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, anyone who is using uh, um, Conda to manage their app stack, like you were discussing on the on the previous slide on their workstation, yeah, uh, will need to put the dash dash login um, um, along with the bin bash um, on that very first line of your your job script to make sure that the Conda activate command will work properly within the job script. Awesome, thank you. 
good catch. And that kind of ties in with the with the next thing. <clears throat> so uh, I had mentioned here the um, um, about the Conda Activate. And so I want to talk a little bit just uh, quickly about the environments that are available on IVEX. So um, there is one, um, so there's one, one module there called machine learning that is a very basic, um, but fairly complete um, uh, uh, module uh, that includes PyTorch and TensorFlow and Jupyter and some other, a bunch of other kind of support tools and scikit-learn and so on. Um, and it's designed for, um, you know, basically kind of getting a fast start um, for a lot of users on IBEX. Yeah, so, so basically, if you didn't have your uh, an environment to create, if you hadn't created your Conda environment on IBEX, you might be able to, you know, start playing around with IBEX using this machine learning module. <clears throat> However, we do advocate, you know, creating your own environments because you can then have the same one between your workstation and IBEX. Um, but it does require some, um, skill and understanding of how to do that with Conda. And so um, I will just point out that there's training available. You can go in and look for introduction to Conda for scientists on the, the training wiki page uh, for, for the VizLab. And there's also some example templates for TensorFlow, PyTorch, and FastAI, um, <clears throat> which can help you get started quickly. Um, they include Conda environments that you can create um, after you've installed um, Conda, and it kind of they provide kind of um, um, an easy way to create kind of your initial environments um, so that you can start start working with. So, um, so at this point, I'm going to assume now that um, you know how to create your environments. So whether either you you kind of you know, module load machine learning just for the basic introductory one, or you create your own. But somehow, you know, in the script, you're going to specify how to load that, um, how to load that um, environment. Um, <clears throat> some important things about um, environment hygiene. So just, just to address some issues that we do tend to come across. Um, <clears throat> so Sometimes people kind of hack together an environment of their own using, you know, a mix of uh, packages from the system, um, Python, their own Python. Um, they mix and match um, uh, um, modules that were, were Conda based. Uh, this is one of the reasons for us to get rid of a lot of these Conda based packages um, that were old because uh, Conda's strength is creating a single consistent environment, and it ha it has a um, constraint satisfaction uh, constraint satisfier <clears throat> built in. But if you try to do that yourself by mixing and matching, you, there's no guarantees that you've got the right version of libraries or tools, and you can get really kind of crazy subtle errors. So don't try to kind of hack together your own um environment that just kind of seems to work um, if you do need help you can always reach out and raise a ticket but you really want a coherent environment and conda lets you do that <clears throat> now not every package is in conda but uh, if you can't use conda you can fall back to pip but we have to be careful about how we do that because um you know uh, we want to install uh, the, the packages into our environment. Um, not in, so you cannot install um, modules into the system environment the way that you may you might be able to on your workstation. So a general rule of thumb is Conda where possible, but pip where necessary. <clears throat> so if you want to use pip in your Conda environment um, or need to. Um, then you should install it as part of the environment. And the other thing that you should do is run it via Python and then you know, dash M for module pip install. And the reason for that is just to make sure that pip picks up the correct environment directory for you to use um, so that 
whatever it installs goes in the local environment. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that you don't need module load CUDA. So there's you know, there's CUDA modules available on uh, on IBEX. So you don't need them necessarily for conda binaries because CUDA comes along pre-built. Um, but there are some libraries that that will require um, um, uh, the compiler, um, and then they, they will require basically the, the, the dev version of the CUDA toolkit. And so, it, um, you, for if you need to get, um, you know, the the dev version of of, of CUDA, uh, two ways to do that is one you can just load the, the system CUDA, which is the development, the, the dev version. It has the includes and the compiler. Uh, but you have to make sure that the version matches up between your Conda environment and um, and your um, and the module that you load. And the other possibility is that you can just Conda install from Conda Forge, which is a, a, a particularly large uh, community channel of tools, and they have the CUDA toolkit, the, the dev version of it. And with that, you will get compilers and so on, um, just in case. So with that, we'll kind of leave the environment and kind of trust that you've got that right. Uh, Glendon, can I just make a couple of quick comments about this? So I just want to reiterate two things um, where I see a lot of user confusion and that um, I see a lot of tickets and deal with a lot of tickets about. The first is PIP. Um, Please, 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 please um, avoid just pip installing something outside the context of a conda environment, which is what we're suggesting here. And as Glendon said, the reason for that is that there are many versions of pip. There's probably a system version of pip. There might be a version of pip that you might have previously installed on IBEX before you knew about kind of this kind of best practice workflow that we're installing. And once you start doing pip install things, pip could install any number of places, depending on the state of your home directory in IBEX. Um, and this can cause, it might work, it will often fail and it's difficult to debug. So this particular workflow when combining like using Conda and Conda environments first, and then pip wherever, wherever necessary, and then always installing pip into your Conda environment, and then using the python-m pip install, which will guarantee that you use the pip that is installed in the conda environment to install within the conda environment, will make sure that you avoid all of these difficult problems that are gonna be very confusing for you and perhaps very difficult for us as staff to debug exactly what's going on. The other is to reiterate that when you're working with conda, and even if you're doing you know, GPU computing with PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, Horvod, um, um, what's the other one, MXNet, uh, maybe, um, or NVIDIA Rapids, when you install these tools with Conda, Conda will pull along the CUDA toolkit, uh, runtime libraries, CUDNN, Nickel, any of these things that is required, Conda will install them in your Conda environment. So you don't need, and you should not do module load CUDA, um, except in some very specific circumstances that we're not going to mention um, here, um, you don't need to module load CUDA and you could end up with like conflicting versions of the CUDA libraries, which might cause your, uh, your job to fail. So cool. that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So there's, there's also, by the way, um, on the, um, IBEX Slack channel, there's also a Conda, um, the, the, there's a, a Conda, um, channel, yeah, it's, it was so a, a conda section, uh, hash conda, uh, and there's information there and also uh, it's a good, a good place to ask questions. Okay, so um, let's just go back here. So we added to our launch file, um, um, basically the resources we wanted to request. And we took a little bit of a detour just to we talk about the environments, but now we are ready to to, to run our, um, our 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 training our, our our launch script. So the way that we will do that is instead of just you know running the the, the uh, training script directly, we will now call sbatch, 
And sbatch is going to basically read in these, uh, you know, sbatch arguments that we put in, these kind of resource specifications at the beginning, and it's going to add this job into the queue. The, the simplest way is if we just go sbatch, then the, the, the batch script that, that, to run, and then anything that comes afterwards is going to be the arguments for our Python code, right? Um, <clears throat> because we have already specified kind of all the default um, resource requests inside the, um, the, 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 the training shell, the, the batch file. But what we can do is we can kind of override these um, and that can be kind of particularly useful um, to try and run kind of like the same training, but in a different place in a different way. So this next example shows, let's say that you've got your, you want to run your training script, but you want to debug something. So you don't want to have to wait, you know, a day or a week or whatever it takes to get into the queue. Um, you just want to kind of quickly try running it. And so there is a partition called debug, which has a few nodes and a time limit of an hour or two, which is good to kind of just explore small, you know, if you need to debug stuff uh, on Ibex and you can't debug it on your workstation, then that is a decent place to do it. You have faster turnaround times, but you don't have access to the same number of resources. So maybe what will happen is that, um, you know, some like maybe your default constraints is you want a V100 um, or, or P100 or something, but that isn't available in, in the debug queue. So then you might say, well, I want a P6000. And you don't want to run for 24 hours, you just want to run for 15 minutes. And so you can, you can override that with specifying the time. You specify the uh, partition, <clears throat> and these command line arguments are going to override the resources and specification that was in the batch file, but the rest of them remain. So, you know, the number of nodes, the number of GPUs per, uh, some are CPUs per GPU, the amount of memory. And then in this case here, I have changed the argument that I pass into my training uh, script. I've changed it to make the batch size smaller. Just so it runs a little, each epoch runs a little faster, or, or that you know, that it, um, or that it fits on the on the smaller GPU. So <clears throat> this bit, so the S batch is how we launch our jobs, how we request them, and it, they do not run right away. It's kind of it's a process. They're in the queue, uh, and eventually the resources become available, and Slurm launches them, and they run, um, and then they produce some log files and some outputs that we will get to. So how do we kind of manage our, the, the running of our jobs? Well, here are some, you know, commands of interest that you can kind of explore further. Uh, but one basic one is to look at the queue and just for yourself. So you can go SQ, which is Slurm Q, uh, dash U, and then your user name. Um, and by the way, so the dollar sign user is a environment variable that has your username. And this way you just see just your jobs. Um, so now, and then you'll be able to see if they're running, if they're pending, um, a little short note about, you know, maybe why they're not running, like not available resources or some other issue. Um, <clears throat> you can cancel a job. Each job has a number. Um, <clears throat> and um, so that can basically, you've seen how to start with the SBatch, kind of see the running state. And, um, and then you can also cancel your jobs. So, um, um, you know, on your own workstation, you kind of do that more directly, you read control C to cancel and that sort of thing. Um, now, if you want to find more information about um, Ibex and about the nodes and kind of what's going on and about your, the deep, more details about your job, you can use commands like gInfo. Um, so gInfo is a, um, um, it is a command provided by the systems team that is designed to give you a nice overview of the GPU um, status of IBEX. So you see how many uh, GPUs are running in use, how many are idle, how many are down or whatever, and it can give you a sense of what sort of available resources are uh, currently there on, on IBEX. You can also do S info, which is a Slurm info, which gets um, 
which basically gives you information about um, the nodes and um, some of their properties on, on IBEX. This command is useful, <clears throat> uh, particularly <clears throat> to find which GPUs are available on, on the node, and also what sort of features those GPUs have. Um, so these are things that you can ask for in constraints, like they're part of the AI GPU nodes, or they're, um, th th they have reference data sets on them, things like this. Um, so this is kind of an example command that you could try. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, S-Control, which can do a lot of things, but one of the things it can do is show more detailed information about a particular job. Even, even if the job finished running, you can get, um, there's a small window of uh, where the information stays around as well. So you can find out which nodes it was running on and how long it ran and how long it was waiting in the queue. And, and if your job isn't running, sometimes there's more detailed information about why it didn't run. So that so because you not do not directly launch your jobs, you now have a kind of a variety of tools to explore, you know, which jobs are running and why they're not, and, you know, cancel them and so on. So that's but that's still we're still within Slurm land and um, IBEX 101 stuff. Okay, <clears throat> a few things um, to be aware of to not do. Um, so one of the temptations when you are familiar with your workstation is you, you're like, you know, I'd like an environment on IBEX that's like my workstation where I can hang out all day and, I, you know, I just run my jobs interactively, right? You know, I just type, I have direct control over it. So, um, <clears throat> so um, some people have tried to S alloc production jobs. So please don't, because uh, this basically wastes resources. And, it, and so basically, you basically have allocated these nodes, but there's no guarantee that you're using them. And sometimes they get left, you know, people go home for to, uh, overnight to sleep, they still have the nodes available, and Slurm can't schedule any other jobs there. Um, so you don't want to S alloc production jobs, you want to use S batch. Now, what if you need to debug something and you need to kind of um, interactively work through some issue um, with a bunch of different tools and so on, um, you can use the debug queue and then you can use s -alloc. So the way that you would do this is you would have to specify the partition being uh, the debug partition. Um, you could specify an hour to, to do this. Um, <clears throat> you'd get, um, you then have to specify the resources that you want here. So we're gonna ask for uh, one GPU, four CPUs per GPU and 45 gigs of memory <clears throat> and a P6000, that's on one of the nodes. And so what will happen is that <clears throat> when, um, when IBEX, the Slurm is able to kind of allocate those resources, which hopefully is, is fairly correctly on, um, on the debug partition, um, you will then, your prompt, you will be at a bash prompt, but on a different node, it'll be, um, uh, uh, it'll, it'll be, um, you'll, you'll be on the compute node. And what you can then do is you can then do S run um, to run your, your training script um, or, and, and then take advantage of those, those resources. Um, or you can, you know, kind of interactively, um, do stuff on, on, on that node. So a note though about S alloc sessions that they do not support the um, uh, S run dash dash job ID that command introspection that we're going to talk about uh, uh, later. Okay, <clears throat> this is kind of the preamble of how we transition from our workstations to, to IBEX and how we get our codes in shape that they can run on both the workstation and the um, an, an a batch environment, <clears throat> how we get launch scripts that basically kind of do what we would do to kind of set up the environment and, and run our, our codes. Um, we've seen how to allocate resources um, and, um, and, and basically get things running. So now that our jobs are running, <clears throat> 
we now get to the kind of the meat of the presentation, which is how to uh, use those resources effectively. So, you know, if we can make your jobs run faster, that helps everyone. Your job gets done faster, and then you free up the resources faster for other people, or maybe your other jobs. The first thing that you will need to do is to make sure that you allocate sufficient other compute and memory resources to go along with your GPUs. So we will do this via the Slurm um, options, dash dash CPUs per GPU and dash dash mem per GPU. Uh, remember that table at the very beginning talking about IVEX and the number of, of um, um, GPUs, that's number of CPUs per GPU and the amount of memory per GPU. That's where you can get um, information. That, so that's where you, from that table, you can get numbers, the values that you will put in here. <clears throat> um, notice that um, one important thing about the memory per GPU is to put a G afterwards for, for gig, because if you just put like 45, I think that's like 45K or something like that, or 45 bytes, so not enough. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so let's talk about a few things about this. So first of all, um, why is this important? Um, so we alluded a little bit previously, but basically um, you need CPUs to feed the GPUs. The CPUs do the work of loading the data sets, <clears throat> maybe doing some pre-processing on them and <clears throat> moving memory around and making that memory available to the CPU. So <clears throat> if you only have, you know, one CPU, <clears throat> um, you know, you, you, you will tend to kind of serialize all these operations. You'll get read operations that wait for very slow IO <clears throat> and things that could be done in parallel won't be. Um, so the, the, the default uh, at the moment is one CPU per GPU, which is really quite bad. Your performance will, uh, you basically will not be able to fully utilize the GPU and your perform performance will be severely hampered. <clears throat> what about the memory? Why is memory important? Okay, so um, typically you want twice the memory that's on the card. <clears throat> and um, you want you know, memory available for the OS to kind of cache as much data as possible. So you might, when, when, you, uh, when you load your um, uh, data sets in, the, the typical way that these deep learning frameworks do it is that they have buffers <clears throat> of data that they've kind of loaded in the background, so in parallel, while the CPU is doing the compute. And they, um, and so they, they, they look in the background, keep these buffers full, they will then be able to do the, um, the shuffles and the other things that are, are needed in this memory. So having a large enough buffer is important to keep the GPU fed, but it's also important to kind of keep the shuffle to be useful. So, you know, if you, if you just load in the size of like one batch um, so at a time and shuffle it, it doesn't make as much difference as if you have several batches load in and then shuffle between them. So, um, so having the, the right amount of resources is important. Too few resources and your, you, your um, job becomes, slows down too much. You know, you can't keep this GPU fed compute takes longer, um, your job takes longer, and that means there's work that could be done that you won't be getting done and others won't be able to use the resources either. So, but there's also another problem and that is requesting too much. So um, you, you want to request only a fair share, okay? And that fair share was shown at the table in the beginning. If you don't, you're going to hurt both yourself if you run multiple jobs and definitely others. And so what we are see, sometimes seeing is people who have only a small um, GPU compute requirement, but a large memory requirement, such as for you know, graph analytics. And so they will get one GPU, but then they will get the whole node, like 500 gigs worth of 
of memory and then run them on an eight GPU node. And now suddenly those other eight, seven GPUs on the node aren't available for anyone. Uh, it also means that if you have multiple jobs that are trying to run at the same time, then if you're doing, for example, hyper uh, parameter tuning or um, a bunch of different jobs with different data sets, um, you won't be able to fit them in there either. So if everyone gets a fair share, they kind of fit nicely like, like, a, like, like blocks, they will fit together and you'll be able to, everyone, all the resources will be available for use. <clears throat> so if you have a, um, a use case where you happen to need um, a, a, a larger than fair share of uh, memory, um, for your type of uh, deep learning uh, training workflow, please get in contact with us. So there's, you know, uh, um, ibex at hpc.cows.edu.sa. That's the, the email. Whenever you log into ibex, it's, it's there. So please get in touch with us. We will find ways to help you out in a way that minimizes the negative impact to other users and, and also um, enables you uh, to, to make your workflows work. So <clears throat> one other thing I should just mention going forward, this is an up and coming thing, uh, but the, um, the systems team is working on improving the defaults. So previously the default was like two gigs of memory and one CPU, if you didn't specify, which is awful for GPU jobs. But the reason for this is that for a CPU job, um, when someone doesn't specify what they needed, that's actually not bad. That, that's actually um, um, a good way to keep people from not wasting unnecessary resources. But in the GPU case, it ends up wasting the resources. So um, th there'll be announcements in the future, but um, in the future, the, the plan is, is that uh, we will allocate a good fair default amount of GPU and memory resources per GPU. And then you won't have to specify it for yourself, um, but only if you have custom requirements. And again, if you do, you should um, contact us to, um, for help. So we have um, got the appropriate resources for their GPU to basically keep it fully utilized. Um, how else will we effectively keep it busy? And one of the ways is that we need to kind of speed up IO. <clears throat> There's a lot of IO in, uh, <clears throat> in deep learning jobs. We are continually reading from large data sets. And so we want to make this faster. And um, some good rules of thumb is to use temp. Um, <clears throat> so this is slash temp. Um, this is local storage on the node. Now, we will talk a bit more how to use this, um, but what it basically is, it's a, um, it's a local, unique, per job, temporary directory. Okay, so local means that it is local to the machine. So there's no contention with users on different nodes. <clears throat> so it's a local resource and, um, and it's unique. So um, you don't have to worry if, if two people have two different jobs running on the same node, their view of temp, um, it'll be different. <laughs> it'll be slash temp, but it'll point to a different directory. So you won't have some other users files in your directory. You don't have to worry about, you know, naming conflicts and so on. So that's the unique part. Now it's per job. <clears throat> so when the job finishes, it's gone, right? So it only, it's only there as long as, as the job is there and it's temporary. So that's the other thing. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, it's fast. So we can really improve performance. On the other hand, um, it's temporary. We could lose anything that we put there, right? And, and you know, because, and also we'd have to kind of load it up with, 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 with our data set before we start. So. On the one hand, you know, improved performance. On the other hand, 
some trade-offs that we have to work around. So not so if you look at the chart at the beginning, you will see how much um, local storage each of the uh, GPU nodes has. <clears throat> the ones that are the most interesting are the AI GPUs, which is the ones with um, V100s. Uh, <clears throat> so, and we will talk about how to take advantage of that um, uh, soon. So, but remember those caveats, you know, you want to make sure that whatever data you put there, you get it off and into, you know, the, the IBEX scratch before the job finishes. So those caveats are, are important. Okay, so reference data sets. Um, a lot of the data sets that people use are kind of standard. They're used throughout the community. And um, instead of having everyone have their own copy and everyone have to kind of copy these reference data sets, which can be quite big, to um, the local storage, <clears throat> the, um, we provide a re some of the some re reference data sets um, that are already on the, the, um, the node, particularly the AI G uh, nodes. Um, so what this does is it eliminates the initial data set copy. Um, so basically, as soon as you get the node that reference data sets there, you can just start reading it in. Um, <clears throat> and it's on fast local storage. So, you know, not only do you get the benefit of fast performance, but by not, you are, are then not competing for resources in the network. So you actually speed things up for other people at the same time it speeds up for you. Now, <clears throat> um, which nodes have these reference data sets? Um, the trick is to look for a feature on the node called reference underscore. <clears throat> and in particular, um, reference underscore 32T, that's 32 terabytes. Um, these are, are nodes that have the reference data sets on them. Um, so to make sure that you land on a node with the reference data set, you need to add this to your constraint. And the sinfo command here basically shows you how you can find that, find which nodes do, and kind of find what their other attributes and GPU are. Um, this is the constraint you have to add to end up on that node. <clears throat> and then what you do <clears throat> is um, instead of pointing to like, you know, slash IBEX slash scratch and whatever you happen to have your data set, you will use slash local slash reference and then wherever the reference data set is. And you can see, so the corresponding version that's kind of on scratch or in the IBEX file system um, is under slash IBEX reference. Um, and there's, there's some for the uh, visualization community. There's also others for NLP that will, that will come. Um, <clears throat> so you can kind of see what data set is available there already to get a sense of whether this would work for you. And um, if you have a data set that's sufficiently large um, and also commonly it, it, it's, um, you know, available to the community and used by other researchers at Coast, um, we would like to add that to the reference data set to make it available for, for everyone. So um, please engage with us. Uh, you can raise a ticket uh, by sending an email there. Okay. <clears throat> So what happens if your data set isn't in the reference data set and you have to copy your files over? <clears throat> so the first thing to do is to ensure that whatever node you land on, it has sufficient resources. Now, <clears throat> there's a bunch of nodes that have like 200 gigs or, or, think, or you know, that sort of size or 500 gigs of, um, of storage. So these are not the, the reference data set nodes, but that might be big enough for your data set. So you basically have to look at the IVEX hardware chart at the beginning <clears throat> to see which nodes could work. And then you also, and then use that sinfo command to find uh, <clears throat> how to specify those nodes because you have to ask for them. Um, so how to copy your data files across. So for a single node allocation, okay, um, so remember that these, this temp directory is local to the node. 
um, you can just do a copy. For example, here's a recursive copy example uh, from you know, your user data set directory into temp data. Um, <clears throat> so there is a potential issue with that. And that's the speed of the copy. Um, so the network is a very high performance network, but it is um, geared toward throughput. Uh, I'll, I'll get to you in a second there, uh, uh, David. So it is, it is geared toward uh, throughput. So um, um, it, it basically is designed to, to send very large data um, frames. Or blocks of data. So if you have, you know, thousands of little files, it will seriously impact the speed of the copy. So if you have a large data set with, you know, 100,000 small little files, don't do the copy that way. <clears throat> what you want to do is you want to create beforehand a tarball of those files <clears throat> and copy the tarball across because the tarball will be very, very large, it will be large, um, and it'll be a single file. So it can get sent across the network as fast as possible. Um, <clears throat> but when you get to the other side, it's still a tarball. So on the local node, you then have to uh, uncompress it. Uh, so David, you had your hand up. Um, yes, I did. Um, so there's a question in the Q&A about the disk size for the slash temp directory that I don't know the exact details of. I think it might vary across the nodes, but I'm yeah. not entirely sure. Yeah it, yeah, it varies across the nodes. Hey, give me a second here. I'm just trying to get the, um, okay, where's the... It's typically taken from the memory. From the CPU? Memory, it's carved out from the CPU memory. Yeah. Um, right, so, so is, it, is it like um, part of the requested memory? So, like, if they request, like, if they requested for their job, like, ninety-two gigs of CPU memory, would their temp directory size be limited by that, or? or well, it would be whatever is remaining. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So we have to. So um, <clears throat> maybe what we need to do is um, a, a follow-up with Greg because the way that he's done slash temp. It's kind of custom, so I'm I'm not sure if it maps to 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 the RAM disk to, to, to memory or if it ra ramps if it, or if it maps to, to local. That's a good point, London. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to find the, the question here. So. so so if it is memories RAM disk, then it's whatever you allocated minus what the application is using. That's the remaining. If it is the local storage, though, that's the 30 terabytes in the eight gigabyte, eight, eight GPU per node, uh, and whatever that table was that we show in the beginning. Yes. Uh, but minus whatever is used already by other users. <clears throat> so, um, um, so Hatim, thank you for that question. If, if um, maybe um, David, if you could just keep track of that user, and we'll have a follow up. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and double check that. Yeah, I put a. Um... I basically answered saying that we've got some details to sort out on exactly what's going on there and that we might try to put them in the slides so that there'll be a record for everybody of, of that somewhere. So I, I kind of think that the, the last time I discussed this with Greg, it, it mapped to, um, I thought it mapped to, to local because um, that, because th that, that was basically how we got the, um, the AI GPU nodes to have so much space because they have 32 terabytes of SSD, but they don't have 32 terabytes of main memory. Um, but let's double check because that's kind of an important thing. So the best way for the user to know it is to run a DF minus H uh, on that directory. Okay. That will give tell you how it is mounted and what is the capacity and what is remaining, etc. Cool. Th but that yeah. The yeah, best thank you for get it from Greg. Yeah, sure. That was, thank you. That's that's actually a, a very important point. I appreciate you bringing that up. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing is, uh, <clears throat> what happens if you have a multi-node job? So the, this temp directory is local to each of the nodes. Um, <clears throat> so you can't just do a copy. And the reason being is that the copy command 
if, if it's not done as part of an S run, a runs and only kind of the root, the first node. Um, <clears throat> so that means only the first node would have that data set. And so one way around that is to use um, Slurm broadcast. Um, now Slurm broadcast broadcasts a single file. So this needs to be an archive. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but it does so very efficiently through all the nodes. Um, and so this will make sure that each of the node that you've allocated on will have that local data set. And then what you can do is you can use srun to go and, um, and, uh, and extract on each of the nodes um, the, the archive. So a little file system guidance. The IBEX Scratch is a uh, BGFS parallel file system. It's very high performance, but there are certain limitations, you know, when lots and lots of people are using, using it. And, the, um, and it performs better with fewer larger files than with lots of smaller files. Um, <clears throat> we have lots of small files around, there's lots of metadata. You know, even just doing an LS means that you are kind of hitting the file system over and over again, uh, making it do lots of work, but not making it send lots of data. So um, <clears throat> if you have director, a directory full of you know, thousands of small files, try splitting them into different directories so that each, um, each directory has a smaller number of files. Or archive that source data into a tarball or a zip files and uncompress them on the compute nodes. Or, you know, alternatively, you can try and wrap them and place them inside containers like HDF5 um, and work with those files via the container API. Um, so <clears throat> basically, lots of small files is not good for IO performance. The other thing to do is to avoid using home for data files for read or write. Um, so, you know, for your conda environments and these kind of these files that get read once, it's okay. <clears throat> the, uh, the reason for this is that home is an NFS file system that's uh, running on a uh, enterprise class um, uh, a file server. Uh, it, its um, objective is not so much performance as reliability. The, uh, but IBEX Scratch is a BGFS parallel file systems. It's, it is, its goal is performance. So <clears throat> you don't want to be using home for repeated reads and writes because that's not what that file system was made for. Now, um, sometimes, you know, you might have a, um, you know, your, your, um, uh, your, your deep learning framework may have kind of a, a data set library and, you know, you can kind of download that library and the default place that it puts it is in the home, somewhere in the home directory. So in that case, usually those example data sets aren't that big anyway. And once they get read once, they're usually cached in memory. And so you're not repeatedly reading, um, <clears throat> but if the if the data set you know starts getting larger, tr try and maybe copy it out of the um, copy it out of the um, <clears throat> whatever kind of the you know the Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch directory where it's currently is and copy it over to Scratch and then use it from there. Okay. <clears throat> oh, Glendon. Uh... So I just want to make a quick comment about the, that third bullet point about using containers and things like HDF5 uh, formats um, for writing your, uh, your data files. So mm -hmm. for those of you who want to do um, or have really large data sets that you're working on, um, maybe hundreds of gigabytes of what would normally be like JPEG files if it's some computer vision application or, uh, or things like this, um, this can really make a large difference and it will, it will require you to, you know, potentially write some custom code. Although TensorFlow and PyTorch are improving their support for formats like HDF5, being able to read them efficiently and directly, you might have to write your own code to basically convert your, um, your data set into an HDF5 file. But if you do that, um, you only have to do that once. And then once that's done, then you can accrue the benefits for all of your future jobs that use that data set. So 
if you find yourself using like the same data set quite a lot, or you know that you're going to be running lots and lots of jobs on this one data set, then it really starts to make sense to think about how can I get this data set that's stored inefficiently spread across thousands of directories and maybe millions of small files into something like HDF5. And it's not, it's not trivial, but it's not terribly difficult either. And a lot of it is just knowing what to Google and knowing that HDF5 is an efficient file format for this and then going out and looking, uh, looking up the code to see how to do it. Awesome, yeah. <clears throat> and so the other thing is that, you know, in, in other, um, uh, thanks David, in, in other uh, HPC uh, domains, you know, HDF5 file containers, is fairly common. There's expertise in the lab. Um, so if you're interested in that, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to, uh, to assist. So, um, and the other thing is that's nice about that is that <clears throat> because it already is a single archive that doesn't need to be uncompressed, you can copy it over in one go and just save that, that uncompressed step. So um, yeah, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so now we've put our files in places where the hardware is fast. We now have to make sure that we can read them in quickly too. Um, so uh, to make sure that the software is working as efficient as possible. So the first step to this is to ensure that, so the best, so the, the best way to do this is to use the um, data set tools um, and pipeline tools that come with your uh, deep learning framework. Those have been tuned and customized for large data sets for, for HPC environments and, um, and you know, distributed training and all sorts of, I'm sorry, and all sorts of things that, um, you know, the, the developers have already kind of tuned out a lot of these uh, performance uh, issues and how to optimize things. So you really want to reuse their work and not try to write your own ad hoc you know, image processing, loading, try not to use like OpenCV or you know, other tools or, you know, readers, use the one that comes with the, um, the, the, the framework. <clears throat> the other thing to do <clears throat> is to make sure that you process the data in parallel. <clears throat> you have um, multiple, so you should have allocated multiple CPU cores. You want each of them to be as busy as possible. And you also want, um, you know, because what's going to happen is that when in software, when you have a thread that starts to read some data, uh, when it goes and requests the read, there's going to be a delay until the data is ready to be sent over. And during that time, the, the, that CPU could be doing a lot of other things too, instead of waiting. And so by parallelizing um, this reading process, <clears throat> you're basically um, reducing the total amount of time that it takes to load the data in, uh, because you'd have multiple reads going on at the same time. Um, the easy way to do that is to, um, in, in TensorFlow, for example, is to use this auto-tune capability where you will um, specify, for example, the number of parallel reads to have, and the number of parallel calls when you have like some sort of a mapping process, you know, where you are mapping some function of your data, um, <clears throat> you'll want to also do that in parallel. Um, and you'll also want to ensure that the data buffers are sufficiently large. So, uh, and in doing this, you kind of will be hiding IO latency. So, if the um, if the buffer is large enough, you can kind of uh, add to it while the compute is going on. And by the time the compute is finished, there is now some data there to be read. And it gives a chance for the computer, for the CPU to kind of get ahead of the GPU. The, um, um, so the, um, um, so uh, if, it, if, if, it's, if it's too small, you know, like if it's just the size of a batch, then you won't be able to read kind of the next batch until you've finished using it for the current compute. And then there's kind of a big gap there where the GPU is idle waiting for the CPU to load the data in. So uh, another way that we can do that is to ensure that the prefetch for our buffer is just you know, auto-tuned and let, and let TensorFlow take care of that for us. Okay. <clears throat> so we have, we have, um, um, 
we have, um, <clears throat> you know, it made sure that our data is in a, in a format and in a location that, that can be accessed efficiently. We've made sure that um, <clears throat> that our codes are also loading it inefficiently, and so that that the GPU can be fed with as much data as it needs. And now we need to make sure that the GPU is actually doing as much work as it's able to do. <clears throat> so one of the things to note is that the V100 GPUs that we have are 32 gigabyte, which is twice as much as the standard V100s that, um, that often show up in, in the literature. <clears throat> so when research students and researchers are trying to duplicate some sort of existing or, or use some existing um, training codes, <clears throat> they may just stick with the, you know, whatever the batch size was in the paper. But that paper, you know, might have been using a different GPU. And so by, um, <clears throat> by not filling up the memory of the GPU and having it work on the whole thing at once, um, the, you, you basically are um, missing out on performance. So you basically, you want your batch size to be large enough to fill the memory so that the GPU has a lot to work on <clears throat> so that that gives the CPU enough time to, to load in the, you know, the, the other data. <clears throat> so, um, so what we want to do is we want to you know, double our batch size <clears throat> and also double the learning rate. So, and this, um, and, you know, and then half the number of GPUs. So we get a number of important wins here. Um, so, um, uh, so we can either do this to kind of, kind of keep the job performance the same, but use less resources, or we can do it to kind of use the same amount of resources, but, but increase or double our, um, the, the number of jobs. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Let, let's let's see how doubling the batch size really helps to increase performance, almost quadruple it. And the reason being is that when we um, double the batch size, um, we're basically able to process each batch in the same amount of time, or close to it. Um, but because the batch is larger, we can now also kind of double the learning rate. And, and in this way, we can start to get converge faster in fewer epochs to um, <clears throat> our final solution. So there are some caveats to this. When, when we do deep learning at scale, um, <clears throat> we, have, we need some like warm up strategies when we start increasing our batch size. And there's a number of techniques and subtle pit, pitfalls to this. Um, and we have a training geared toward this, as the best practices for distributed deep learning. Um, the slides for it are um, available at the link there, and we will be holding um, another training seminar uh, coming up in, in, a, in a month or so. <clears throat> anyway, the point is, fill the memory as a good way to make sure that the um, uh, GPU uh, is being as utilized as, uh, to its full potential. <clears throat> so the other thing we have to do is just to make sure that it is actually performing as we expected. We just can't trust that just because it seems to work that it's working efficiently. So what we want to do is we want to monitor the GPU utilization. One way to do this is we can do it interactively. Um, <clears throat> and so, when our jobs are running, we can use, remember, the SQ command to look at what, what, are, what jobs of ours are running. And each of those jobs will have a job ID. And what we can do is we can add in additional um, job steps that let us kind of query or explore what is happening on those nodes. So um, the first one is an example of a um, just a, you know, running an bash interactive shell. Uh, which lets us kind of do anything on, on, on that node uh, within our job. Um, the last two, though, are, are very useful. The, the NVIDIA SMI daemon is the device monitor. And if you run it, NVIDIA SMI will start showing you the 
uh, compute and memory utilizations for each of the GPU devices that you have as part of that job. And <clears throat> the other thing that you will want to do is to look, look at top. So top shows you how the CPUs are being utilized and how, and how many threads your process has. So this dash, dash H here um, lets you show the number of threads, uh, <clears throat> which first of all, that kind of makes sure that your auto tuning has been done correctly um, and that you're parallelizing the data loading uh, uh, stage of your, your training. Um, and, um, and, and you, you want to see um, you know, sig significant uh, CPU utilization um, and significant number of threads as well. <clears throat> so one of the things that's coming, um, it's under development, is, a, is DCGM support on IVEX. So DCGM is NVIDIA's data center GPU manager solution. And what it will do <clears throat> is it will generate post-job profiles it's automatically enabled. You won't have to do anything. And so when it's ready, uh, there'll be an announcements. Um, <clears throat> but what you will just do is in the directory where you launched your job, where the other log files would typically be, you will find after your job completes, um, shortly after, you will see this DCGM GPU stats file with a certain naming format that includes the host name and the, the Slurm job ID. And if you have a, multi, a job running on multiple nodes, there will be multiple files. Um, so what you will want to do is review all, possibly multiple log files for the job um, <clears throat> with the same job ID, okay? So that, that's kind of important that they all have the same job ID. Um, <clears throat> and you can look at how to use less, which is kind of a, a pager that lets you kind of scroll through multiple files. Um, I know some people use Vim, but Vim is an editor and um, less has a similar uh, non-edit commands to Vim. It's for just viewing. Uh, <clears throat> so the things that you want to focus on there is device statistics for um, the kind of the SM uh, compute unit utilization and memory utilization. And you want to verify that all the GPUs have utilization, not just the first one. Um, this, we'll come back to this in a bit, we, what happens when you have multiple GPUs. Um, the, a note about the max GPU memory used, it's not very informative uh, because frameworks tend to pre-allocate as much memory as they can and then kind of <clears throat> dole out actual memory that they're using from this larger pool. So that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. And um, ignore the device, uh, the, 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 the uh, PCI bandwidth um, output, that's not showing anything currently. And the per PID statistics, the per process ID, um, ignore those now, for, for now too. Okay, uh, what might we see in our compute utilization when, when we do these kind of like NVIDIA SMI daemon uh, commands? <clears throat> so, um, or these bouquet, um, dashboards that David will show later. So we could see, you know, uh, consistent, you know, compute utilization above 90%. So that, that would be very, very good. That would be excellent. <clears throat> um, and we can also get like consistent but middling utilization. So maybe, you know, less than 70%. So, you know, maybe you can start thinking about is there ways to, you know, some, tw some potential tweaks. Uh, maybe the batch size is a little bit too small. Um, <clears throat> uh, is it possible that there's hidden oscillations? So, um, <clears throat> so uh, what, what could happen is that, you know, the GPU goes to 100%, then it has to wait for the CPU. So it's down to zero, then it's back up to 100%, and then down to zero. So you get these kind of oscillations where it's really busy, and then it's not busy, really busy, not busy. And um, um, so, you know, if that's kind of happening, that can indicate not enough CPUs or the uh, data loading isn't uh, paralyzed well enough. Um, <clears throat> when you um, have, um, okay, so another possibility is that 
you know, you, you have multiple GPUs and the first one is well utilized, but the others aren't. So, uh, or like the device doesn't show up in the process, in the process monitor. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you have a job with, with two, um, uh, you allocated two GPUs, but when you look at PMON, which is the NVIDIA SMI process monitor, you see that, you know, Python is only bound to one of those or, or it's bound to both, but only one of them is getting utilized. Um, and so that typically is an initialization issue um, where you're not, um, you, have, you haven't set um, the, 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 the framework up to use both GPUs. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll see that and utilize all the allocated C GPUs later on. Okay. <clears throat> so, if we start seeing, you know, oscillations, um, there's a number of reasons between, between high utilization and low, there's a number of reasons that we can see that, including insufficient uh, CPUs to load and process the data, you know, so make sure that your CPUs per GPU is, is um, a reasonable number. <clears throat> it could be that the data isn't loaded in parallel, you know, make sure that the right values are set um, as part of your data load pipeline. Um, <clears throat> maybe the GPU isn't busy for long enough. Well, we could try increasing the batch size to help hide some of that latency. Um, maybe that's because of slow IO performance, you know, so try loading the data from your local storage instead. <clears throat> so another possibility is checkpointing pauses. So when you save the checkpoint of your training out to local storage, uh, so you'd want to do this to local storage and we'll talk about this later on, but basically during this checkpointing save, you know, you can't do training and that's natural, but typically what will happen is that if, you know, your epoch lasts, you know, tens of minutes, you'll see like good utilization and then a drop off for a few seconds or, you know, tens of seconds, and then it's back up to full utilization for many minutes. So, <clears throat> but we would like to decrease the time that the GPU is waiting for the checkpoint to be saved, saved, and we can do that taking advantage of local storage, being careful though, because it is temporary. Okay. So we need to make sure that all the GPUs are utilized. So if you do request multiple GPUs, you will have to make changes to your code to support them. Now, fortunately, this is in most um, of, the, of the frameworks, very easy. So TensorFlow is multi-GPU aware. The only thing you need to do is, is, um, is just wrap um, your training code and your, uh, your model creation up in a strategy. And so an example would be, you could create a, a mirrored strategy. Um, and then what you would need to do is you need to, of course, multiply the batch size, your base batch size by the number of GPUs that you were that were going to be used. Um, and then when you create your model, you would do it within this strategy scope. Um, <clears throat> PyTorch, uh, the tensors are assigned to GPU devices manually, but so David is the expert on this. And I also think that by default, it might choose CUDA devices, depending on your install of PyTorch. Um, <clears throat> but um, we, we, can, we can discuss that later on if you have questions about PyTorch. <clears throat> There's also another way to make use of all the GPUs and that's used Horovod, which is um, a, a, basically it's a more efficient way to perform multi-GPU uh, training over MPI. So the performance here is very good. It does require more, uh, a change, there's, there's more invasive code changes that it requires. There's about six different types of changes that go into the code <clears throat> and details are available uh, as part of our distributed deep learning best practices training and uh, link below. Um, <clears throat> I think that link also has like a video as, as well. So you can see um, um, yeah, and, and slides, but the performance it, it's significantly improved. And, and definitely worth exploring if you want to get the most from all the GPUs. Okay, so let's talk about one of these potential 
um, pauses in GPU utilization. And that was when we saved checkpoints out. Typically, maybe, you know, <clears throat> every epoch. So um, the um, <clears throat> one way to make this a little faster is instead of saving it to um, Ibex Scratch, to your Scratch folder, which is on the BGFS parallel file system, you could save it to local storage on temp. <clears throat> so the temp is fast, but it's also temporary. And when the job finishes, it will go away. So you want to make sure that you have written everything out. And one way to do that is you can have a background task using rsync, which is a type of a file copy, uh, remote file copy command <clears throat> um, that has some intelligence with caching and so on, to, um, to basically copy from temporary storage to, um, to uh, Ibex Scratch in the background. So this is a type of uh, kind of uh, manual parallelization in that um, <clears throat> because the frameworks cannot do training while they are saving the checkpoint out, uh, <clears throat> we're going to just let them save to a, uh, a fast disk uh, so they can get back to training. Um, and then in the background at the same time, using these extra CPUs that we have allocated, we're going to copy those files over to persistent storage. So let's talk about copying in the, in the background. <clears throat> so here is a little example of a, um, a bash code that we could use to do that. And I'll just show you, I'll just kind of walk you through this a little bit to get a sense of how it would work. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna initialize with some configuration um, uh, variables that basically say <clears throat> um, uh, how, how long we wait, um, uh, basically how often we check to see if, if the process is around and how, how often we would typically do, um, <clears throat> and how often we would typically do um, um, the R sync. So I think this one is, is set up to kind of run every hour, but it will check the um, <clears throat> if the if the if the main process, the training process, has finished. Sixty seconds after that, it would start um, its final um, uh, sync. <clears throat> so, what we do is we run our a Python training code like this. Of course, we have to pass in what the lo what what the checkpoint directory is going to be as an argument, <clears throat> along with whatever other training args that we have. And the important thing is that we will run it in the background, which is what this ampersand is for. <clears throat> and then we will get the, uh, the process PID uh, from this dollar sign bang. And then at the, at the end of the training, we now have this loop that will kind of keep repeating kind of forever. Um, or at least in, until we know that the run is done. And so what we do is while we start with, with the run is not done and while it is not true, so while we're not done, <clears throat> we are basically going to kind of loop through. Um, so if we wanna check our, our PID um, every minute, but we're willing to wait, you know, and every to do the R sync every hour, then what we'll need to do is kind of <clears throat> break every six, every minute, every sixty seconds, and check if if the process is still there. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this inner loop is for, because <clears throat> we're basically going to sleep for this very small interval. <clears throat> and if we find out that our process no longer exists, we're going to break out of this loop. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna say that done is true and break out. And then after we've gone through, so after we've gone through our 60 loops of waiting a minute each time, you know, so basically our process is still running, but um, we've waited enough times, uh, we will now do our, our sync here. And there's an example of the command that we could use.
So we, we are halfway through. So David is suggesting whenever it's good time for a break, a bio break for the people, that would be nice. Okay. Um, so th this is a. So this is a um, kind of a, a break between sections. Um, but um, okay. So why don't we take like. Um... I was going to say maybe like a 15, but we're very close to, to three o'clock anyway. So if we can came back at three o'clock, that would give everybody a nice break. And then we'd have another. Um, okay. Um, so I'm hour or something. I, 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 I wasn't aware that we had, we had a break anyway. Um, okay. Um, break, I, breaks are always appreciated. This is a very information dense uh, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. training. So, okay. So, um, so you said three o'clock? Yeah, I would say we come back at three and then we finish up with however long uh, it takes to cover the rest of the material. Okay, perfect, sounds, sounds good. Okay, right. I'll be back then, thank you. Okay, so I'll pause the recording and then we'll pick it up again at three o'clock. Okay, thanks a million. Awesome. <clears throat> Hi guys, we're back from break now. Cool, hello everyone. So <clears throat> we're actually, um, uh, two sections in, we've kind of got an overview of uh, IBEX and what, what makes it different from your workstation and how to transfer your work from the workstation to IBEX. We've also seen the first part about how to make use of the resources that you get and to try and use them as efficiently as possible. <clears throat> so the next thing we're gonna talk about is how to get access to more resources. <clears throat> and in particular, how to uh, chunk your training into smaller job steps um, that can be interleaved with other users um, and that allow you and allow everyone to make a little bit of progress every day. Um, and these uh, approaches also would enable you to, if you were to run um, on AWS, um, it would let you benefit from the reduced prices of the spot instances. So um, this basically what we're going to show you is how to make your training kind of robust that you can kind of um, recover and restart from wherever the training left off. Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, this works on IBEX. And it also helps AWS. In their case, because you're paying for it, you can get a lot more training done um, more cost effectively. <clears throat> so the first thing is, is that um, requesting a job that's less than 24 hours um, um, has benefits. At the moment, it's for wide jobs with more than four GPUs. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in, in pro, we're progressing, I think, toward um, uh, this is a simple 24 hour queue. And the idea is, is that if you're able to um, make your job fit within 24 hours, you will be able to get, and everyone does this, or you'll be able to get faster turnaround to get early results. <clears throat> um, you'll be able to interleave your jobs to make regular progress and you'll have access to these extra resources because there are some nodes now that are just are, are, are for these particular types of jobs that have trouble fitting in um, uh, with uh, the other nodes that have long running um, jobs. Basically, the queue was getting fragmented and couldn't fit in, you know, uh, uh, jobs that needed you know, multiple GPUs because you had very long running single GPU jobs at basically blocking that node. So um, um, so, so the eligibility for this is just, it's just automatic. And um, basically if, if your time is 24 hours or less uh, and you're requesting a GPUs and you know, you would do this with the uh, GPUs per node, a command as we've discussed, um, you would become uh, eligible uh, for this as well. Um, so one of the, you know, the things that this also benefits is, um, you know, when people can, when everyone can, can kind of request the, a job that's, you know, a week long, 
and you just want to make sure that see if your job works or, and you want to start it and you know 15 minutes after it starts if something crashes right and and now you're seven days behind everyone else before you can get back in so uh, this is why we kind of want to encourage people to be able to fit their jobs together together into kind of smaller packages it lets slurm do a better job of scheduling, it lets the scheduling happen more fairly, and um, it lets the scheduling happen more fairly, and um, it lets everyone make make progress. Um, and it, it helps accommodate people. So, how do how what do we have to do to kind of make our jobs that might take longer than twenty four hours work within such an environment? So the first is that we need to have checkpoint and restore support. Now, <clears throat> almost certainly your training does have checkpoint support because you have you want to save your model out uh, at the very end of training. And it probably has restore support because you know you want to load a, a previously trained model so that you can do some inference and analysis with it. So probably the code for this is already in your in your um, 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 in, in your, your training codes, but maybe not being used quite in the same way that we're about to advocate. So <clears throat> a, a few points about this. The checkpoints um, are going to be read, written and read by a single task, and usually the root rank, but restored to all. <clears throat> and the reason being is that you, you don't want to read your checkpoint multiple times. You just want to read it once. But all the GPUs need to end up with the the model in memory. <clears throat> so for a single task, you know, multi GPU, the check, you know, the simple standard checkpoint and restores are sufficient. For Horovod, you're going to have to wrap this logic up a little bit in knowledge about which rank you're on. Um, let's say the examples are, are there. Um, <clears throat> So we'll also want to checkpoint to temp because we have less time to run. And so we want to make this process of, of saving the checkpoint as fast as possible. But then of course, because temp is temporary, uh, we will want to copy it to persistent storage in parallel. So just as we discussed previously, um, but we can restore from the persistent. <clears throat> we don't have to copy the checkpoints over to local storage because we're gonna read them just once anyways. <clears throat> the other thing that we'll have to keep in mind when we start adding this checkpoint restore is that we'll want to checkpoint at, at reasonable intervals. So regularly, but not too frequently. And the check, checkpoint delay, the time it takes the checkpoint should be overall a small fraction of the epoch training time. And if you encounter issues with this, that you can't quite get that working the way you like, again, please ask us for help. So here's an example of how we can write a checkpoint to, to local storage. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the wonderful pathlib library. It's got Python 3 thing instead of OS paths. Um, and we're going to basically um, you know, get the path where we will write checkpoints to, and we will get that from our arguments, right? Um, and we're going to make the directory. Um, we're going to create all the parents if necessary, but it's, if it already exists, we, we will just leave it as a directory. Uh, so we can do that in just one line. And then what we will do is we will create our checkpoint <clears throat> um, and add it to the callbacks. And so we'll, in the, in the Keras example, we'll um, <clears throat> create our model checkpoint, specify the checkpoint directory, um, <clears throat> do a little bit of a um, modifying the name of the checkpoint based on the current epoch we're in. And that will come from, the epoch will come from somewhere in the loop that we're in probably. Uh, and save that out to an HDF5 file. Um, <clears throat> and we can do things like modify whether we save the best only. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, because we are saving, um, uh, so, because we, we, we want to save the checkpoints after e every epoch, even if it wasn't the best, and the reason being is that because we will, if we restart, we'll want to restart from that previous state. So, <clears throat> maybe, you know, we, we trained, you know, to, to 
15 epochs and it started to do a little bit worse and we didn't save, but then the job stops. We don't want to go back to here. We kind of want to keep going, starting from where we left off just in case you know, things start improving again. So, <clears throat> um, so um, save best only is false. And for the save frequency, a specified epoch as a string. So in the case of, and again, you'll have to just read the documentation for your preferred framework on this. But uh, in the case of Keras, if we specify the save frequency as an integer, that's actually the number of samples, uh, not the batch number of batches to process before saving. So it's, um, so we just do every epoch that that'll be, be good enough. But if we want to like do every two epochs or some other calculation, we will have to figure out how many samples that, that um, we have and update that. Okay, how to restore. <clears throat> so um, again, using the path lib um, package, you know, we'll create a path uh, the, the checkpoint directory, but this is the one that we will read from, which may be different because we may write out to a local one, but read in from the persistent, like the Ibex scratch. Um, <clears throat> and what we're going to start doing is basically just look through all the checkpoints that are there and try to find the most recent one. So uh, before we get into this loop, we need to kind of keep track of whether we found every, anything. So by default, we haven't found anything. And, um, and we're now starting to go through the range of potential epochs. This is the, this again is, is an argument that we've passed in for the number of epochs, uh, total number of epochs for, for our, all our jobs. And <clears throat> we'll kind of go through them. And for each one, we're gonna go through and re in reverse order. <laughs> So from, you know, so instead of going from zero to whatever, we're going to go from 100 down, 99 and so on, so that we find the latest one first. And we, um, <clears throat> again, we look for our particular file. Um, <clears throat> we are, are going to look for the specific name of it based off of the epoch number that we're looking at. And if that file exists, then that's going to be the one that we're going to use. Um, <clears throat> and um, um, and uh, at that point, we just kind of quit out and we're done. And so, and if the checkpoint file path is not none, so we did find something, then we're going to load our weights. And that's the, kind of the basic um, algorithm that we can kind of, the basic approach to, to load, sa saving and, and, and loading checkpoints. Okay. So once we are um, saving checkpoints and we can restart from the latest checkpoint, um, we now, um, you know, our jobs can become more robust. If they stop someplace, they can be restarted. So what we have to do now is we have to split the training to run over multiple jobs. And um, so, this is going to involve some some difference, some changes to how we launch our jobs, um, and some you know other issues to kind of keep in mind. So, one of the issues that's going to come up is that uh, because we have you know shorter job times, we're going to we're going to need to run more jobs, right? This won't be a large number of jobs, but it. Um, you know, if if we if our training normally took seven days, then we will need to end. We'll end up having seven jobs, <clears throat> and each of those jobs will do a fraction of the work. So we will have to modify the training code um, to restore from the from the latest checkpoint, which we saw how to do. Um, we will also need to change it so that it processes a fixed number of epochs um, or a fixed time limit. Um, <clears throat> so, um, because what we want to be able to do is we don't want our job to be killed by slurm for taking too long. Uh, we want to be able to exit cleanly well before our, um, uh, our final time um, so that <clears throat> the checkpoint file that is saved out uh, is not corrupted, right? And, and that we have time to 
to, 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 to read it and, and copy it um, off of the, the local um, temporary file system. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing is that using reference data becomes on the local storage becomes more important because um, um, because we are break, so be, because uh, we're starting the job multiple times, <clears throat> the sort of operations like the you know copying over the training set <clears throat> um, that um, the total amount of time that is taken on the on these sorts of tasks is going to increase as well. So we kind of want to do whatever we can to minimize that. So. If our initial data set load time is zero because we use reference data, excellent, right? Um, <clears throat> so we also want to make sure that our jobs run in sequence. Um, <clears throat> so um, so that you know we don't want to run all the training together because that doesn't make sense. We want we want to basically <clears throat> continue where our previous job left off. And we're going to do that via support that Slurm provides. Um, and in, and um, in the future, um, uh, KSL, uh, we, we may introduce workflow management tools such as Decimate, which they have been using on, on Shaheen for HPC workflows um, to help kind of improve the, the restarting and, and management of these jobs. But for the most part, the approach that we're going to show here today, which just relies on kind of plain slurm, is not that hard. It's um, the um, it's you know a little bit of some some batch scripting and and some of the existing slurm commands will are serviceable. So the first thing that we need to do is to um, is, is, to, is to modify how our uh, launch script is going to work. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the, um, this first part here, this is really just configuration to come up with a job name. Um, the reason that we're interested in having a unique job name is because uh, we can specify dependencies um, a singleton dependency is purely based off of the name. So it'll only run one job of a particular name at a time. And one way to do this is to um, basically make use of whatever parameters that we would pass in, um, that we um, use that as a kind of a, a naming scheme. Um, the other thing that we'll have to do is kind of figure out <clears throat> how many total epochs uh, we will run and how many epochs we want uh, per job. And we want to pick a number of epochs per job so that um, even in a worst case or the typical worst case, the, um, <clears throat> the training will finish before the 24 hours is up. And so we have to account for things like, you know, sometimes IBEX slows down because someone's hitting the file system really hard and, uh, and that will affect our training. So we want to, you don't want to see how close you can get to the 24 hour limit because you want to save some time for, uh, for, for doing that final sync to the persistent storage. And um, so, and you want to make sure that that final sync happens. And one way to do that is to make sure that the training script finishes cleanly. Um, so those are the two things that, that are happening here. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the, um, the first part has to do with kind of calculating total number of epochs and how many we want per job. Um, the second part is kind of you know, the parameters that we will pass to our job. And then we're using a bit of kind of um, a bash uh, string magic to kind of remove um, the characters, to, to the kind of the, the invalid characters. Um, <clears throat> from the parameters to kind of create a descriptive string. So, and then, um, and, and if you want, you don't have, to, you, you can make up your own name as well, you know, just some simple name. But if it's unique, then you can have multiple jobs running at the same time, but they're part of a different, you know, training session, right? They're part of a different training sequence. So if you're doing um, uh, parameter tuning, <coughs> 
you can have, you know, uh, jobs running for for different parameters, and they would run in, in parallel. But um, you, you basically you you want a name that prevents um, makes it easy to prevent the, the same job from trying to run the same training and duplicating training. So if if all the jobs, you know, uh, start. So let's say you have uh, a job that only takes seven days. You split it up into into seven sub jobs. And, um, and each job does 10 epochs. What you want is the, is the first job to do the first 10, you know, one, zero to, 10, zero to nine, then 10 to 19, and so on. You don't want all those jobs to run at once. And then they each kind of repeat the training of the zero to, uh, to the 10 epochs training. So, that, so that's the kind of the purpose of that. But you could just kind of come up with your own name and be done with this. Now, here's where the kind of the, the, the main, the core part of this uh, multiple job launch script comes in. <clears throat> Instead of having a single S batch, so you can kind of see here where we have, you know, S batch and there's a bunch, of, and then we can see our train job and so on. We can see that. Um, so that's kind of the core of our usual launch scripts, right? This is, is, is um, <clears throat> or, or, or normally how we would launch a job is with sbatch. So this is going to wrap that up. And we're going to loop through this and run this sbatch multiple times. Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's some differences here. So I'll walk you through it. So, <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to introduce two new um, arguments to sbatch. One is parsable, and the other is kill on, on invalid dependency. So parsable just makes it pr produce some output um, that we can use as the job ID directly, um, because we're going to want to create this dependency. And as you can see, um, when I call sbatch, whatever sbatch returns is going to go into underscore job ID. That's good. And, and what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to create my dependency argument. I'm going to update it so that the next dependency is going to be after the last job finishes OK. OK, so the parsable is so I get the job ID out as a nice number. Um, and that job ID is used to kind of create this dependency chain. Um, and the dependency type is after OK, which means that um, if the previous job fails for some reason, the next job will not run. <clears throat> and the other thing is, is um, this kill on invalid dependency, which ensures that um, cancel jobs also terminate. Um, so, if, so if you go to S cancel the currently running job, you don't want the next job to start up. You kind of want all of them to, to go. So, and so basically we kind of loop through the total number of jobs we're going to do. <clears throat> and originally our dependency is going to be kind of the singleton, which is, you know, basically it's going to be name-based. And then after that, the dependency will be on the previous job launched. And this will basically create the chain of jobs. <clears throat> so to manage them, we have our sbatch tools. Um, you can see which jobs there are using the sq command, as we saw before. And um, uh, you will also see the pending jobs. And they'll probably give reasons that the pending is because of, de of a dependency, but that dependency is, is the running job. <clears throat> you can, um, so you can also cancel interactively. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is maybe more useful um, if you're just using dependency singleton for all of them, um, because in this, because the way that we have things set up, once you cancel a job with S cancel, all its dependencies go. But if you have multiple jobs running, this interactive job canceling can, can be useful when you have, you know, a, a few jobs in the queue. Um, <clears throat> and you can also cancel all jobs with a particular name. So, um, that kind of lets you just get rid of the whole set. This is just kind of reinforce what we had mentioned previously. You know, we really need to make sure that we exit cleanly as, as much, much as possible. Uh, and which you can, and so, you know, provide ample time. 
And the other thing that you can do is part of the you know resource allocation in your batch script, um, <clears throat> um, your, your Slurm batch script, you can specify these mail type and mail users um, to send yourself notifications in certain cases. And so you can send yourself a notification in the case that the job failed or timed out or was almost about the timeout. So if you check on that, um, <clears throat> if you got to like 90% of the way through the job and it still hadn't finished, um, you know, maybe you want to adjust how many epochs you try to fit in the job. Um, and again, use the reference data sets. Okay, so let's do a bit of a review here. <clears throat> so um, what do we have to do to make deep learning work well on IBEX? Well, we need to automate our batch training. That's really important. and that, sort of automation, you know, it can be useful even on your own workstation and you can get it working there. So <clears throat> embrace the batch mode, you know, uh, via sbatch, <clears throat> make sure that we capture hyperparameters as job parameters. Um, and, and, um, and uh, so, so that by having these parameters there, <clears throat> it enables us to kind of use the same script in, in different situations, whether we're trying to debug something quickly or run at full performance in production. So the other thing that we need to do <clears throat> is uh, to make sure that we fairly allocate sufficient resources. So fair is important and sufficient is important. So if you don't ask for sufficient resources, your, 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 the performance of your training uh, will be impacted. Um, if you um, don't ask for a fair amount, um, what will happen is that the amount of resources that are available for you and for others will go down. Um, and, and this particularly could have um, significant impact because you know it's, it's very easy to, to make seven out of the eight GPUs on a node unavailable for yourself and for others. So if you need to, for, if your workflow or training has uh, special requirements, please come and see us so that we can find, um, you know, the best way to make things work. You know, we're never going to say, you know, no, you can't use IVEX for training because it's not fair. We're going to find a way to make it work, but we want to at least find the best way, right? So the other thing to do is to make sure that you access the file system's efficiency. So use the right file system. That's like not, not your home directory. <clears throat> um, use the reference data sets where you can. Take advantage of, you know, um, <clears throat> of putting your, your data writing in, into temp. Um, use fewer but larger files if you can. Um, <clears throat> The other thing to do is to parallelize GPU, CPU, and I/O. Try to get them to overlap. They're all, you know, get the compute overlapping with the I/O, you know, with the CPU loading and pre-processing data, <clears throat> so that there is few gaps. So that basically you don't want the GPU waiting. Um, you know, use multiple workers. Make sure that things happen as concurrently as possible. Use those fairly allocated but sufficient resources, both CPU and memory that you that you asked for. Um, so you also want to make sure that you're fully utilizing the GPU. And um, typically this has to do with the scaling up the, the batch size and the learning rate. Um, but verify that this is happening. You know, I take advantage of NVIDIA SMI. Uh, David's about to do a really nice demo, I believe. Uh, showing a uh, really nice dashboard to actually uh, <clears throat> watch the, 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 the performance profile of your codes running. You know, <clears throat> so, so make sure that all the GPUs are being used. Um, and then you know, split your training in the 24-hour blocks. Uh, this will, this is, makes you a good citizen with others. You know, <clears throat> um, and it gives you access to additional resources. And it lets you use even resources uh, external to Coast uh, uh, more efficiently. So the um, other thing, you know, please uh, engage with us. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, we have upcoming we have upcoming training training uh, for a distributed um, a deep learning with Horvod. Um, we're also interested in what your experience is like using IBEX. Um, you know, what are the queue times like? What's your job overhead? What's your experience like? Is, are things working for you? And um, so that we know how to improve that. So the, we, you can con contact us a variety of ways. Um, <clears throat> so email is, is for tickets, things that require uh, maybe a little more back and forth. Um, but you know, for quick questions and and you know, fast short responses, we also have a Slack channel and a, and a bunch of channels there. And and the ones that might be particularly of, of interest to you are General, uh, GPU, and Conda. And uh, uh, David has also created a bunch of example projects uh, that are well worth checking out that can help you get started uh, <clears throat> with example and example uh, a deep learning. Uh, workflow that includes Conda and and best practices for IBEX, um, and you know, uh, and, and shows you how you can uh, pass in parameters uh, to your training code and, and how you can set up a, a bat script and what sort of resource to ask for. So it's a um, it's a it's a nice place to start and well worth looking over. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of resources for you and. Uh, what I'll let, so I think what we'll do is um, we will uh, maybe save we'll can save questions to the very end, but I'll pass it over to David now um, to to show you um, how the dashboards work in the example uh, training. Um, sure. So thanks, Glendon. Um, so. My part, in, in case you guys are feeling a bit overwhelmed by all the information that we've been been sharing, so my part's going to be very short. It's going to be about ten minutes, and then do kind of a Q and A uh, with the Q and A section um, before before we break. Um, so what I wanted to show you is the, uh, the project templates that uh, that Glendon mentioned. So. Um, on uh, the Cal Visualization Core Lab uh, organization page on GitHub, at the very top, we have six pinned repositories. And these correspond to the project templates that I, uh, I maintain um, for, to help people get started with different machine learning and deep learning frameworks um, using a lot of the best practices that, um, that Glendon has talked about and that he and I have kind of learned by doing and using IBEX with these tools. So the, the six that I, I maintain are um, PyTorch and TensorFlow um, are the two kind of uh, deep learning uh, frameworks that I maintain. And then the third one is Horovod, which is my preferred method for my preferred framework for doing uh, deep learning on IBEX, even if I'm only using a single GPU. Uh, and the reason is that um, if I invest the upfront cost to use Horovod, even for even if I'm only right now using a single GPU, then when I'm ready to go to multiple GPUs on the same node or multiple GPUs across multiple nodes, all I need to do is make a few changes to my Slurm headers, and I don't have to touch my code at all. And then my training will take advantage of the additional GPU and CPU and memory resources. Um, with PyTorch and TensorFlow to use their built-in primitives for deep learning, there's a, a um, typically a step change when you try to go from um, one to two GPUs or one to as many GPUs as available on a node. That usually is a, a little, you know, just a little change. But then if you want to go from one node to multiple nodes, that usually requires a substantial additional amount of work and understanding um, to use the built-in primitives for that, based on my own experience. Um, so what I wanted to show you, then of course, the other three that I maintain is one for NVIDIA Rapids, um, one for Scikit-Learn. So Scikit-Learn is one of the, uh, is probably the most widely used machine learning uh, package um, generally. Um, it's a CPU-based uh, library for doing machine learning. It's a great place to start. Um, you know, we focused a lot on deep learning. The 
majority of you know data science problems are actually not solved by deep learning, but are more solved by uh, what we call you know classical approaches to machine learning. You run into loads and loads and loads of these uh, in industry applications, um, and then Rapids AI uh, Nvidia Rapids is basically accelerating. Uh, the kinds of algorithms that you want to encounter in scikit-learn, but to take advantage of GPUs. So I'm going to pick Horvod because as I said, it's kind of my preferred method for deep learning. And this is a deep learning focused training. So if you take a look at the Horvod um, project template, um, what you can do is if you want to use this template yourself, you could just uh, click use this template. And then you can select your own GitHub account um, and then give it a repository name and a description, and then hit create repository from template. And what that would do is that it would basically create a copy of all of the, it would take a snapshot of the current state of this template and then create a copy of all of these files under your own GitHub account. From there, you could then clone that repo down onto IBAX or onto your own workstation, do whatever kind of development that you wanted, and then um, use that as your kind of place to get started. Um, and the reason that this is helpful is that I've included a lot of things like an environment file um, for Conda that encodes all of the key dependencies that you need to use to get Horvod up and running with support for, um, by default, it supports PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, and kind of all of the bells and whistles that you might want with, uh, with Horvod. Um, but if you're just using PyTorch or you're just using TensorFlow, then you could kind of drop out all these extra dependencies that, that you don't need. Um, it also contains um, a bin directory, which has a lot of example scripts. Um, in particular, it has scripts for creating a Conda environment that you can just run and some instructions about how to do that are in the readme. Um, and then it also has some uh, some training job scripts that encode a lot of the practices that um, that we've been discussing. In particular, I'll take a look at the single node job script. So if you look in the headers here, so this is using, uh, would be using eight GPUs on a single node with six CPUs per GPU, which is the recommended number for V100s as discussed in the training. And then we set this mem equal to zero, which is basically a shortcut that just says use all of the available memory on the node, which is appropriate and fair because we're asking for all the GPUs on the node anyway, as well as all of the CPUs. So we're basically asking for our own private node to, to run our job. Um, and then a lot of this um, script is basically kind of setting up the persistent logging directories, which are going to live in persistent storage on Scratch. And then local logging directories, which are going to live in the slash temp directory on the on the node. Setting up the software stack. And remember, as discussed in the training, so here I'm using the conda activate command um, in the um, in the job script. And at the top of the job script, I need to run the job script as a in a bash login environment in order to make that conda activate command work work as expected. Um, and then there's a few extra things. And the one I want to talk about um, now, so here um, I'm starting up a dashboard, a GUI dashboard that I'm going to demo in just a second that, that does real-time monitoring of GPU, CPU, memory, network bandwidth utilization for your job. Um, it also has an example of how to get TensorBoard up and running, which is a, a common um, um, is a, a common thing that users uh, users want to do, and these these are um, run, all of these are running on the compute node, so they're not running on a login node where they might be um, causing congestion um, and for other users. They're all logging or running on the compute node, you know, using resources that you you have requested, and then we start our training job. And then here towards the end, we have the actual logic that Glendon mentioned about. Um, copying the checkpoint files that are being written to the fast temporary storage on the node and syncing them over to the persistent storage. So you can see that's being done here with these rsync commands. So, um, and then finally, once all of the training would be done, um, then we kind of kill off our 
our running processes just to be neat and tidy. And then we do one last kind of uh, copy of the, uh, the checkpoint directories just to make sure that we get, um, we get everything and we don't, don't miss any checkpoint data. Um, now, what's nice about this is that I, using a lot of environment variables, this script could be reused without modification. And you can just pass in your own training script uh, as a, a path to a training script as an environment variable a path to where you want to log the checkpoints to, a path to where you want to um, write the checkpoints to uh, locally, where you want to log uh, TensorBoard to, and then you know whatever other um, parameters that you would need to pass. And, um, and you could use this with very little or no, no modification. But this JupyterLab, uh, JupyterLab NV dashboard server is what I want to show you next because it's, it's really cool. So you can start this server up running on your compute node. And then once it's running in the background, you can, from your local laptop or workstation, you can point it at a particular URL to where that dashboard is running. And you can get, um, you'll get a landing page that looks like this. And it has a number of different, um, um, kind of dashboards that you can look at. Uh, the first one that I, um, I like to look at is the GPU uh, resource utilization. And so what we see here, and so this is for a, oops, that's not relevant. Um, what you can see here is um, I have a uh, two GPU job that's running on a single node. Uh, these are using P100 GPUs, so not our, our V100s. And you can see that pretty consistently, I'm getting very close to 100% GPU utilization on both nodes. And you can just kind of sit here and you can watch this for a while and kind of get familiar with the, the utilization rates um, and patterns for your job. Now, the overhead for this dashboard is, is, is uh, very low. Um, I noticed that when I run these jobs with the dashboarding completely turned off versus the dashboarding turned it on, and there really isn't any substantial note, uh, uh, increase in GPU um, utilization when the dashboard shut down. So it really is quite a lightweight, uh, lightweight dashboard that's going on. It's doing a lot of like really po small um, polling. Uh, of the GPU to find out what's going on on the GPU. And then all the other resources are basically using CPU resources on the node to, um, to uh, run this job. The other thing that you can see is memory. Um, so you can see the number of gigs that your data set is, uh, is using. So these P100s, I think are 16 gig cards, um, something like this. And so um, they're using you know 11 out of the 16 uh, gigs available on the card. So one of the things I could do with this job is probably increase the batch size some amount, push up the memory utilization on the device to max out the memory on the card. Um, and then that would also increase the GPU utilization maybe a little bit more, try to almost peg it out at 100% um, all the time. And then down here at the bottom, you can see um, you know, network kind of reads and writes um, data basically moving back and forth. If we were on V1, or if we were on um, uh, V100s where much of the data transfer is, is happening, um, not through the PCI uh, Express, but through uh, NVLink and other, uh, and other technologies, then you typically would have a lot lower levels of traffic going on through the, uh, the PCI Express. You can also use this to check out your, uh, your CPU utilization. So here's a dashboard of, uh, of CPU utilization and CPU memory. So you can see here that the CPU utilization um, is fairly low, about, uh, about 20%. Um, and that's not necessarily bad, you have to compare like what's going on with the CPU with what's going on with the GPU. So I, the most important thing is that your GPU utilization rates are high. And since I looked there, I went there first, I know that my GPU utilization rates are high, then it might just be that I don't have a lot of extra work for the CPUs to do. Like 20% of the 
six CPUs that I have available is enough to keep these GPUs fed and working at almost uh, full capacity. And also you can see that there's not really much going on with CPU memory in part because I'm pulling batches of data, um, which are um, not, each batch of data has to come through the CPU memory and then goes into the GPU memory. And um, I could potentially you know, increase performance by trying to read an entire data set into memory and then, and then accessing the data from memory directly rather than pulling it over from the file system in batches. But again, because I know that my GPUs are already kind of maxed out, then that might not really improve my overall job performance that much. Um, so that's why I always kind of start with the GPUs and try to figure out what's going on with the GPUs. And if the GPUs are very underutilized, then there's a lot of different knobs and things that we can uh, that you can play with to try to get those GPU utilization numbers up. Of course, if your GPU util your GPUs are just completely pegged at 100% all the time, then kind of no matter the only thing you can do at that point is maybe try to get access to more GPUs. Um, playing around with I/O and CPU or things to to change the I/O or get more work done on, on the CPU side you know, we'll have, you know, there's not much more you can do if you're already kind of maxing out your GPU, I would say. Okay, and just to, uh, to remind everyone, so if you're interested in using this dashboard, so I'm gonna try to put up a video on our, uh, on our YouTube channel that shows how to do this uh, in, the, in the near future, kind of walks you through step-by-step -step how to add the uh, MV dashboard dependencies to your Conda environment and how to uh, set this up and running in a, in a new job script. But if you go to um, any of the GPU related um, project templates, you can look in the, um, the environment file. And in the environment file has a section on pip and where it installs pip dependencies from the uh, requirements.txt file. Then if you look in the requirements.txt file, you'll see that here is this Jupyter uh, lab NV dashboard dependency. And so you can kind of see where, how to get the dependency um, from these template repos. And then in the bin directory, of course, in these uh, batch scripts is where you'll find kind of the, the section on starting up the uh, dashboard server running in the background, things like this. Okay, so that's really all that I had. Um, I just kind of wanted to point out these project templates and to make you aware of them, kind of walk you through the structure of one, show you something that's really cool that, uh, that I use on all of my jobs to kind of make sure that things are working as expected, uh, which is the, the bokeh server um, for, uh, Jupyter Lab into dashboard, and um, and so yeah. So I think I'll just kind of wrap up there, and we can take questions. Um, if you have questions, if you put them in the Q and A, then I will kind of act as a moderator. I think we'll try to answer all the questions live, um, unless we get overwhelmed with a flood of questions. Um, also, uh, uh, thank you very much, David. That the uh, bouquet dashboard is. It's always always amazing. Always nice to see. Always nice to see. So, so. that's cool. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, look forward to seeing you at upcoming training, whether it's uh, training from KSL or the data science training that we have coming up for KVL. Um, I would plug particularly the Conda training that's coming up. Uh, not this coming Tuesday, but I guess two weeks from now. This time, I'll be teaching Conda. And if you are, um, if you don't have any experience with Conda at all, then I would encourage you to come along. Um, it is a really useful way to do data science, uh, machine learning, deep learning uh, on IBEX. And um, even if you end up not using it, it will kind of, I think, open your mind to a lot of um, um, issues around reproducibility and portability of uh, workflows and things like that, that you might not have previously considered. 
Awesome. And, and it's also, it's, it's great on the personal workstation too. Just, you know, I, I use, it, use it there as well. Thank you, everyone. I wish you all the best. Good luck with your trainings and, um, um, and take care. See you. Bye.